And now I'd like to turn it over to Russell Cannon, who will give us some tips about how to work with institutional research offices. Russell? Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, so we've heard some great examples of how to be efficient in matching scope, how to work with partners. So now we'll turn to some strategies uh, on how to actually get the data. And in higher ed, that uh, very often means a conversation with institutional research, or uh, it's often abbreviated IR. Uh, I should say that IR looks different in different schools, and what I'm offering here is just my own perspective. Uh, I do come at this both as someone who works in IR and as a, a researcher in a higher ed research lab in Wisconsin where we do a fair amount of evaluation. So between those two capacities, I've had the opportunity to serve on, on both sides of the data request, uh, so to speak. But that's the perspective uh, from which I'm addressing this. So uh, you may recognize this first slide as the last scene of uh, Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, just after the title character has been assured that this, this priceless treasure uh, is being looked at by, by top men, uh, when, when in actuality it's being crated up and wheeled into an airplane hangar full of uh, lots of similar looking crates. <laughs> and uh, you know, as much as we like to talk about being data driven in higher ed, uh, there's at least a, a little bit of a metaphor here. Uh, and that we're, we're pretty good at getting data archived. We're not always great at making it actionable. And, and in as much as that's the case, uh, you can think of IR as, as sort, of, sort of the archivist. Um, it oversees, at most institutions, reporting. Um, the office often conducts research on the school for the school, if that makes sense, um, and handles both internal and external data requests. And I'm always reminded uh, when folks ask me about sort of how to work with IR of, of some advice I received from a history professor uh, who told me that the, the most valuable research method she, she ever learned was how to talk to the archivist. <laughs> uh, I remember saying, you know, these, these folks, uh, they're not going to know your subspecialty in the detail that you do. They, they may not have your, your same degree or training. Uh, but the archivist knows the archives, and they know it better than you, they know it better than anyone else, they know it better than whatever you can find online about what's in there, uh, and that can be incredibly valuable. Uh, and, and so in, in that same way, uh, IR at most institutions is the place to go to learn both what data is available, including pointing you to things you may not have thought of, uh, as well as a place to get a good sense of data's limitations. Uh, so what data points are less useful because they are inconsistently captured, uh, because the snapshot dates are off for, for any number of reasons. And so there may be other folks who can tell you, maybe even in IT, you know, here, yes, we do have a data field that says GPA uh, from high school, uh, but they may not know that that's only there for 30% of students, and it's, it's known that it's wrong for half of those or something like that. Um, an added benefit uh, of institutional research is that because they are that central hub for data requests, they often have a pretty good sense of what other evaluations are happening on campus and the data that they are using, so a good sort of big picture perspective. Um, and then uh, finally, a sort of uh, important thing to keep in mind is that it's very common for folks in IR to be trained in social science research methods. They may even be responsible for conducting internal evaluations for the institution. So it's very possible that they're able to sort of speak your language of evaluation and provide another set of eyes in the early stages as you're developing your strategy. Uh, you know, I personally am always excited when someone is looking to put the data to good use and is willing to have a conversation about how to do that well. Uh, and so with that in mind, we'll turn to sort of a few tips on how to work with IR. And this, this slide is simple, but boy, howdy, is it important. Uh, just first and foremost, I'd say, and I, someone's already mentioned this today, go to institutional research early. At any given moment, uh, the office is probably juggling 20 different data requests. Uh, if you wait until close to the deadline, uh, not only are you going to be dealing with a stressed out IR office that may not be your best partner in that moment, um, but there's not going to be the space to take full advantage of all the data that's available. There's going to be very little time to pivot if things change. Uh, and there's even some possibility you might not get what you need in time. So get your data request in early while you're still in your planning stage, while you're making that logic model. Uh, many IR offices will have a data request form. Absolutely fill that out, set the stage. But also, I really recommend that you ask to meet in person, to sort of sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, and I think that, that can go uh, a long way. Uh, in terms of efficiency, that extra time cost in that moment will be worth it in the long run. 
And so in that first conversation, I really would encourage you, um, again, uh, beginning when you're still in the planning stages and starting the conversation with what you want to find out, then turn to the data elements that will best fit your needs. So you know, are you trying to figure out if students will become more engaged in their communities, uh, that they will end up in STEM careers, that they will increase their financial literacy? Start there. Um, and then take, take the opportunity to explore what data may speak to those things. Now, one sort of flip side I'll say to going to IR early is absolutely you can have these conversations, but you probably don't want that to be your only interaction. There is a, a you know, just being real with, with myself and the world that's out there, uh, there, there's a way in which the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So it's very important to follow up even after you've made your initial data request, still several weeks out, how are things going? Is there anything else you need from me? Uh, th these are just ways to work effectively with IR offices. Uh, the final thing I'll note, uh, just all of these equally crucial, is come bearing documentation, okay? If there is a, uh, a required plan from the funding agency, uh, are there definitions? You know, when you say retention, is there a very specific uh, uh, definition of retention that's by the funding agency, are there particular dates by which you need things? Um, now, and to be clear, it's not uncommon for funding agencies to be really vague about some of these things, and uh, and that's that's okay. What I say there is first, make a phone call. <laughs> Actually, get on the phone with them and see if you can sort of push them towards the definition. And if they sort of push back and say, no, 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 we, we don't really have more specificity than what we've given then take the time to come to an agreement about these things with the IR office because there's nothing worse than having an IR office spend hours pulling data and then coming back and saying, oh, you know what, it turns out that what we, what we thought we were asking for with retention, we, we described it incorrectly. So here's the way we really need it. Uh, go ahead and iron those things out first. Uh, it's one of those things, uh, measure twice, cut once, right? And so uh, with, with that in mind, let's, let's change now to uh, what actual data IR offices have access to. And, and again, this can vary somewhat from institution to institution, uh, but often if IR doesn't have it, it can at least point you in the right direction. Uh, this first slide is, is sort of is the classics. This is the, the golden oldies, the, the go-tos that just about any IR office anywhere is going to have access to. Uh, because uh, they are required uh, for federal reporting. And there are lots of requirements about the quality of that data. Now, as Lori mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the unifying theme of today's presentation is about efficiency. And uh, you, you know, everything that I'll, I'll mention in terms of these data elements are things that, in theory, you could probably try to collect yourself, but it is incredibly time consuming to do that. So remember that when you're using institutional data, you're not just taking advantage of the data itself, but you're taking advantage of all the institutional processes that collected it and that verified that data. And the, you know, the professionals that knew the sort of official uh, federal definitions, and those are things you can't always get when you're interacting with, uh, for example, the faculty member that teaches the course or an office that may have access to the data but is not familiar with the definitions. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, the, these data elements on this first slide, the sort of student demographics information, enrollment information, also to some degree some sort of top-level budget information and financial aid information are all things that are uh, sort of institutions are federally mandated to report to the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data Set, or IPEDS. Uh, now, there's still ways in which this data is imperfect. Uh, there will still be some missing data elements for some students, but it's sort of the closest thing that we have in truth. And it, it, for these data elements, uh, the institutional data is usually considered the so-called source of record. Again, sort of it's the best we got. Uh, but in addition to these, uh, which I think most of you are probably familiar with and you might think of when you're thinking of an IR office, I encourage you to think outside the box uh, in a few different ways. So one, one area uh, that some IR offices will have control over or they can at least point you in the right direction is institutional surveys. You'll find these in almost every school. 
Um, in some cases, be tied to student ID so you could track students in your particular cohort. Uh, more likely, the surveys will at least have demographics questions that let you come up with a sort of baseline or comparison group information. Uh, common surveys are admitted student surveys, new student surveys, first year senior engagement surveys like NESI, uh, graduation surveys, and alumni surveys. Just about any institution will have at least a few of those. Uh, a second sort of source of information that can be really helpful, a little out of the box, is just a, a, a list or, or maybe just a sense of what other programs exist on the campus. Uh, the, these can be uh, things that are happening in student affairs or in a student success office or in uh, a different academic program. And these groups can be partners. Uh, they can be potential opportunities for embedding assessment, especially if it's something like a first-year program that all students go through. Uh, they can also be confounders, right? So it can be really helpful to know if the same year that you're trying out your intervention, there's this other huge thing that's affecting all first and second year students, right? So that could be a really helpful set of data points. Uh, and then the, the final thing, and this really varies from institution to institution, but increasingly, institutions are trying to track student behavior a little bit more carefully with things like ID card swipes. Uh, so you can learn things like, have the students in your cohort been attending tutoring sessions? Have they been going to the library more often? Have they met with an advisor recently? Uh, again, not always the case, but IR can often point in the right direction on that. And then, so we've talked about out of the box. Uh, we'll, we'll now sort of talk about out, out of the room that the box is in, right? <laughs> so uh, these are a few areas to which the institution uh, may submit data, and both the central data sources and the data that gets submitted can be helpful. Uh, so the first is the National Student Clearinghouse. This is a national nonprofit that gets quarterly reports from registrars. It's something like 95% of institutions in the country. It can be used to track whether students who leave your institution have ended up somewhere else uh, so at another uh, higher ed institution, and including in graduate school. Uh, it can be very helpful because it also captures students who move out of state. And IR can often help you facilitate, or uh, can help facilitate a request to the National Student Clearinghouse. The next one is, is relatively new, state longitudinal data sets. They're now required uh, of states by the federal government. They're, they're imperfect because they're relatively new. They only track student movement within a single state, but they can be really powerful uh, if you're interested in what happens to students after they finish school. Not only can they track whether students are transferring to another institution within the state, but often they can track whether they are employed, what their salary is, and what their career field is. Uh, that can be really important if you're interested in not just getting STEM degrees out there, but getting students into STEM careers, for example. And then finally, I thought we'd just take the example we provided earlier, the Bio-Inspired Solutions to Human Challenges uh, class that sort of, you know, long story short, uh, is trying to uh, increase the number of pre-majors that are going into STEM, particularly women, and sort of taking that as a, as a way to say, what data might be brought to bear uh, to this type of evaluation that IR might be able to help you with. So one set of data is probably just baseline demographics. I know that was one of the uh, points on the quiz that, that not as many people chose. And, and yet, if we're saying that a core outcome of this is increasing women in STEM, then there's, there's sort of no way that that could work, right, if the course itself uh, enrolls no women, <laughs> right? So uh, it, it can be really helpful to know sort of what's the baseline information, both for the campus, for engineering in particular, for intro courses. Uh, you know, is the, cam is the campus 10% uh, women? In that case, it might be very ambitious to try to get 15% women uh, in STEM. Uh, is the campus 60% women? It's a very, very different scenario. Um, there may be even a similar, uh, a similar course out there, right, that maybe it's not doing what we want it to. Uh, is that course serving as a gateway course? That is to say there are already lots of women in that course, but then none of them are moving to STEM? Or is the course somehow uh, dissuading women from even signing up for the course? Are there very few women in that course, even though there are lots of women in the institution? These can both be helpful in getting a sort of sense of a baseline. And then, when you're looking at the new course, uh, a sense of how you've done with your outreach outcome. Uh, retention is probably important to you at lots of levels. You know, A, is the student finishing the course? B, uh, is the student eventually graduating from that institution? 
Uh, now, you can graduate from the institution but never have a STEM major. Is the student getting a STEM major? And is the student then staying in that STEM major until a STEM degree? These are all data points based on enrollment data, where institutional data is probably going to be your source of record and honor can help you out. But then as we also start to think about some of these out-of-the-box possibilities, you know, maybe it's that these students uh, are you know, getting really interested in STEM, but maybe it's a STEM program that your institution doesn't offer. So it may be considered a success if they are transferring to another institution and taking on a STEM degree there. So that's something you might be interested in tracking or getting a graduate degree in STEM. And then finally, it, uh, surveys uh, and course evaluations and other sort of out-of-the-box sort of thing could be helpful in evaluating outcomes. Um, are students coming to the institution saying that they're interested in STEM and then they're not signing up for this course and not going into STEM? Or are very few women coming to the institution saying that they're interested in STEM? So part of what you're doing is just increasing their desire to even consider it, right? And then course evaluations, which I are sometimes overseas, but they can at least point you in the right direction, can give you a sense of what's actually happening in the classroom. You know, just a limited snapshot, but it's something. Uh, so, again, this is only a very simplified example, but hopefully gives you a sense of some of the data elements that can be brought to bear uh, for this type of evaluation and how a partnership with IR can get you to that point. Thanks.